Hi. Um, so if you can hear me, would you mind saying so in the chat just so that I'm sure that this is working? Hi, great. Okay, so I'm gonna give it a little bit of time and just kind of talk about what this is and then we'll get started. So, I've decided to put this together, this project together, um, A Night of Sacred Music. It is a social distancing lecture recital. Well, what does that mean? So, I will be presenting uh, this great historical sacred music and then I will sit down and we'll talk about it a little bit. I have a whole PowerPoint of notes prepared. Uh, there are also recital notes for anyone who wants to head over to the Facebook. So tonight, uh, with the exception of the last piece, we're actually going to start in 1826, I believe. And then we're going to go backwards in history. As we go back, uh, we're going to go to 1799. We will be in 1741 and then 1724. And then we're going to fast forward to the 1970s for the final piece. Um, hopefully this will allow you to hear a piece and then hear what it was inspired by and what it actually came from. Uh, feel free to comment on the live stream if you have any questions or have any thoughts and I will do my best to answer them. Um, it's a little hard with my tech setup. I'm having to make sure there aren't any major tech issues, which leads me just to discuss the last point, the format of this recital. All of the music is pre-recorded and the lectures are live. I went and made the decision to pre-record all of the music so that we could avoid any major tech issues with the style of the music that will be performed this evening. Um, so it's 7.02, my time. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. And hopefully you can just sit back and enjoy. people rend your hearts rend your hearts and not your garments for your transgressions even as he lies has sealed the heavens through the word of god i therefore say to ye forsake your idols return to god for he is slow to anger and merciful and kind and gracious and repenteth him of the evil truly seek me, ye shall ever surely find me, thus saith our God. If with all your hearts ye truly seek me, ye shall ever surely find me, Thus saith our God, thus saith our God. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might even come before his presence. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might even come before his presence, come before his presence. Oh, 
that I knew where I might find him if with all your hearts ye truly seek me ye shall ever surely find me thus saith our God ye shall ever surely find me Saith Lord God. All right. So now that you've heard some music, let's kind of establish some need to know terms for the evening. Um, so one word that you'll hear come up over and over again this evening is oratorio. Great. What is oratorio? Uh, oratorio is a large-scale musical work. It's pretty similar to opera. So what are the differences? Well, at times, that line's extremely blurred. Um, oratorio specifically is defined as a large-scale musical work for orchestra and voices and is typically a narrative on a religious theme. That typically a narrative on a religious theme part is a really big deal. Um, while sacred opera does exist, it's not really the norm. So we see oratorio traditionally as the religious storytelling object, storytelling device. Um, also, there are there's traditionally no staging, no costumes, and no backgrounds. Uh, so it's not like a theatrical work. It's usually a soloist and conductor, and then behind them, an orchestra, and behind them, a chorus. So it's a bit different from a music theater opera work. So what was the piece that you just heard? That was an excerpt from Mendelssohn's Elijah. Elijah was first performed in 1826 in 1826 and was written during the transitional period between the classical era and the romantic era. It's actually the most performed um, oratorio to date, simply because it can exist in both the Christian and Jewish canons as it never mentions Jesus. To me, it's definitively romantic in scale, scope, and music, and we'll kind of see that when we analyze the music a little bit later. Elijah follows an established tradition of oratorio composed at, th at this point of being composed simultaneously in German and English. So the score is written actually in both English and German. Um, obviously you heard English. That's kind of the standard for this specific work. Keep this in mind. Uh, we'll see several examples of it throughout the evening. As you might have guessed, given that it is an oratorio, and is a, which is a sacred narrative, and is called Elijah, it actually follows the biblical narrative of the prophet Elijah, and takes texts primarily from 1 Kings. However, we also get some texts from other Old Testament uh, books, as well as actually the Gospel of Matthew. The first piece of music that you heard tonight was the character Obadiah's Reset Aria Pair. Okay, what does that mean? <laughs> What is recit and what is an aria? So recit or recitative is spoken song in oratorio. And it actually serves to advance the plot. Some people say it's comparable to dialogue in music theater. Um, while an aria, which translates to air, is comparable to a song in music theater where so as recit serves to advance the plot and is dialogue, an aria kind of sits on a certain idea, it meditates on a certain idea, and is equivalent to a singer getting up and sharing their heart, just belting their hearts out in music theater. Um, recits traditionally have much more text in a shorter time, as you might have heard in this very first piece in the recital. 
So earlier I said that this was definitively, definitively romantic. Why? Well, we can look at the vocal line and see great examples of romanticism. It actually doesn't touch the tonic or the home note for quite a while. It um, features several large skips and it indicates tonality in the least stable way. Um, the vocal line starts with a if with all your that your is the tonic that's the home pitch so up if with all your everything before that is still trying to get us into this land of e flat major um additionally having that b flat to g so mi re that's actually the least stable form of tonic of the tonic chord um, instead of just saying do mi so mi do uh, just something really interesting to keep in mind uh, romanticism avoids stability traditionally something else that's interesting to note is Mendelssohn varied from standard composition and performance practice here usually in opera and oratorio the tenor is the hero. He's the primary protagonist. Here that's not the case. The tenor is just a supporting figure. Uh, the tenor is the character Obadiah and the character of Elijah is actually sung by a lower male voice or a bass baritone. So moving on from Mendelssohn's Elijah, let's talk about Haydn's creation. Haydn's creation was first performed 30 years before Mendelssohn's Elijah. So this piece is definitively classical in nature. Things to listen for that support that. It establishes a theme within the instrumentation long before the theme is echoed, long before the theme first appears in the vocal line. Additionally, the theme actually starts with so do, which is the most stable way to establish tonality. Um, and even afterwards, the entire first part of the vocal line, so do mi do so, which, for any of my musicians out there, know that that's just a one chord. And so it's really interesting to see this um, because I would argue that one of the defining factors of classical era music is stability. You don't typically change tonalities, at least not often in classical works. So like Elijah, creation was written in German and English simultaneously. This is important and we'll find out why it, with the next oratorio we look at. Creation, as you might be able to guess from the name, is a celebratory oratorio that tells the biblical story of creation according to Genesis and is divided into three parts days one to four days five through six and then day seven or the Garden of Eden um, it actually doesn't talk about the fall of humanity at all until the very end of the work and even then it really only hints at it within the text and the music after briefly hinting at the fall of humanity it turns right back around and goes back to celebrating and glorifying God. Something interesting to note is that it was primarily written in the key of C major. That's kind of the overarching tonality of the work. Um, when I say tonality, in case anyone's wondering, I just mean key. Uh, so this C major, historically, major represents good or happy and minor represents sad. So this key of C major actually represented at the time innocence, purity, and God. And I think that's really important in this oratorio called The Creation because the creation story to me is the story of the world in its purest form before it is corrupted by the fall of man. So what you've heard or what you're about to hear is this tenor aria sung by the character Uriel and it is the introduction of Adam and Eve. It comes in on the second part of the oratorio on day six. Uh, this text paints Adam in a glorious way and it does write Eve in kind of, kind of equal, 
but she's primarily supportive, uh, with fondness leans upon his breast, the partner for him formed. So Eve leans on Adam. However, you can tell the music wants this equality to happen. So let's take a second and listen to one of the standard tenor arias in the oratorio repertoire uh, in Native Worth. And honor clad with beauty, courage, strength, adorned, in fact, with Ronsardine, he stands a man, the Lord, and King of Nature. Large and arched brow sublime of wisdom deep declares the seed, and in his eyes with brightness shines the soul, the breath and image of his God. And in his eyes with brightness shines the soul, the breath and image of his God. Fondness leans upon his breast, a partner for him formed. A woman fair and graceful spouse, a woman fair and graceful spouse. Her softly smiling virgin looks a flowery spring the mirror bespeak him love love and joy and bliss her softly smiling virgin looks of love spring in the mirror bespeak him love love and joy and bliss bespeak him love and joy and bliss. So just some fun trivia before we move on. If you'll remember correctly, I talked about the classical era being extremely stable in tonality. Uh, the end of that piece actually was just a C major chord. So the entire thing outlines this C major, uh, just as the entire work does. And I just think that's fun. So the next piece we'll look at is the piece that most people are going to be most familiar with, most people listening are going to be most familiar with, um, and that's Handel's Messiah. It's uh, arguably the most well-known oratorio, though, like I said, it's not the most uh, performed. That's actually Mendelssohn's Elijah, which we looked at at the very beginning. 
Handel's Messiah was composed in 1741 and took 24 days to write in full, despite having 53 movements. Um, that's really fast, considering everything at the time was written by hand. It was also written in English and German. This is where it's really important to talk about that point. Um, Haydn was inspired to write Creation after seeing Handel's Messiah on a trip to London. So he wrote Creation in English and German following Handel's model here. Handel wrote SDG, or Soli Deo Gloria, at the end of his original manuscript. What this translates to is, To God Alone Be the Glory. This, combined with the fact that it was composed in such a short time, and this story, this rumor, that when Handel wrote the Hallelujah Chorus, the heavens actually opened before him, encourages this apocryphal belief that Messiah is a divinely inspired work. Um, this could be true. Uh, it's really hard to say. We're not in Handel's mind, and we're not God. But it wasn't exactly uncommon for major works to be composed this quickly during this time, uh, even though the composers were writing exclusively by hand. There are stories of other large oratorios being written in 24, 28 days. It's not super crazy to hear something like that. However, even if it's not divinely inspired, uh, many works, such as the Hallelujah Chorus and the For Unto Us, have inspired religion and have inspired individuals for years by existing within the Christian canon for, well, since 1741, frankly. Um, even nowadays, the Hallelujah Chorus, we stand when we hear it. We have expectations behind this piece because it's so well known and so established in the church. Messiah, written in 1741, is very transitional, again, between Baroque and the Classical era. The Baroque era is sometimes called the Broke era, B-R-O-K-E, and it is, and you'll see that within these vocal lines. These vocal lines tend to be fast moving and incredibly difficult, and frankly, they don't sound like they're entirely put together all the time. That's pretty standard for the Baroque era. The Baroque era was known for being difficult. It was known for embellishments. Uh, it was known for exciting vocal lines. However, as we've already talked about, this piece is pretty classical in tonality. Most pieces within the work will want to stay extremely tonal and will stay in one key. Um, Messiah is divided into three major sections. The prophecy of God, so the prophecy and coming of Christ, the passion of Christ, so the days leading up to his death, and then a few days following his death, and then the promise, the fulfillment of God, the fulfillment of the defeat of sin and the salvation through God. We actually only usually hear the first two parts. The third part really doesn't fit in the liturgical calendar, so we don't hear it that often. Um, Unlike Creation and Elijah, the soloists are actually completely unnamed in this oratorio. They're simply listed as tenor, soprano, bass baritone, so on and so forth. Um, so the tenor, that's me in this case. The tenor actually opens the oratorio and does not come back for the entirety of part one and doesn't make another appearance until the middle of part two when he sings a gauntlet of recits and arias and then leads into the hallelujah chorus. So tonight, what you'll hear is three selections from the work. This is by far the longest section of this recital. Um, it's about 12 minutes of music. So we start with the opening recit aria that I have mentioned previously, Comfort Ye in Every Valley. Afterwards, we'll fast forward <laughs> several pieces into the middle of part two. I believe it's within the 30th, the area of the 30th piece, 30th movement, into Behold and See. Um, and then, and just a fun trivia about that, 
Behold and See actually ends on a half cadence or a musical comma. So you'll hear this desire to have more music afterwards. Finally, we'll look at the tenor aria, Thou Shalt Break Them, which leads into the Hallelujah Chorus. To me, this is one of the most athletic pieces of music in the English tenor oratorio repertoire. It's very fast moving. It's extremely Baroque. Uh, it's actually usually faster than what you'll hear recorded. I was just limited working with pre-recorded accompaniment. So get comfy and let's listen to a lot of Messiah. of him that crieth in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, shall be exalted, shall be exalted. Shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill may lower the crooked straight 
and the rough places play. The crooked straight, the crooked straight, and rough places play. And the is plain. Every valley, every valley shall be exalted. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill made low. The crooked street, the crooked street. The crooked street and the rough places plain, and the rough places plain, and the rough places plain. The crooked street and the So just some really interesting things to point out before we move on. Uh, if you'll remember, I talked about classical tonality being extremely stable. That piece is the perfect example of it. Um, it is definitively E major. Everything about it is E major. It doesn't want to move in the slightest. This piece is, for the most part, the same. This is the one that ends in the musical comma, the half cadence. Uh, it's also much shorter, as is the piece after. So I won't take a break and talk in between the two. Behold and see, behold and see, if there be any sorrow like unto his sorrow. Behold and see if there be any sorrow like unto his sorrow. Behold and see if there be any sorrow like unto his sorrow. He that dwelleth in heaven shall laugh them to scorn. The Lord shall have them in derision. Thou 
shalt break them. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Thou shalt dash them in pieces, in pieces like a potter's vessel. Thou shalt break them. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel, like a potter's vessel. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. All right, so we've made it through the Messiah Gauntlet. So, now that we've gotten through that, let's look at Handel's most famous contemporary, uh, Johann Sebastian Bach. So, this next work we're going to look at is Bach's Jesu der du meine Seele, which was composed in 1724 during Bach's tenure as cantor of St. Thomas in Leipzig. Um, you'll hear extremely difficult music. Uh, this is definitively Baroque in nature, and hopefully you'll be able to hear that if you listen with those quote-unquote Baroque ideals in mind that I've mentioned before. The recitative, which actually will not have accompaniment in this specific recording, moves consistently between tonalities, or keys, and the aria is extremely athletic and features large and quick jumps and fast moving lines despite its relatively slow tempo. Um, Bach had a tendency to write for voices as if they were instruments, which makes perfect sense given that he was an organist. Um, so if we look specifically at this cantata, the text comes from a hymn of the same name by Johann Rist, and it's considered a sacred cantata. Great. But what, it, what actually is a cantata? So a cantata is defined as a medium-length narrative piece of music for voices with instrumental accompaniment, typically with solos, chorus, and orchestra. That's fantastic. But if we look at our definition of oratorio, everything matches up except the medium-length versus large scale of the oratorio. In this way, um, defining pieces as sacred cantata versus oratorio, it's really blurry. Uh, that's a blurry line in the same way that the line between oratorio and sacred opera is blurry and the line between secular cantata and opera is blurry. This is just the musicology way of life. <laughs> so something, however, a way that we know that this is definitively a cantata is that Bach's Jesu der du meine Seele was written for a weekly church service. Uh, so it's actually on a lower scale than his well-known Passion Oratorios. This comes from the second cantata cycle, a year-long cycle of cantatas to accompany, as I said, weekly church services, and was written for the 14th Sunday after Trinity Sunday. It touches on a lot of really complicated topics in such a brief period of time. Um, it touches on the contemplative nature of man, just absolute despair, 
and the celebration of God, all in about seven movements. It's known for the second movement, uh, which is not something you'll hear this evening. Uh, it's a treble duet called Wir Eilen mit Schwachen. What you'll hear tonight is a recitative called Ach, ich bin ein Kind der Sünden, and an aria called Dein Blut so meine Schuld durchstreicht. If you'll notice, I'm speaking German. If you're interested, the translation is available in the program notes um, that I posted on Facebook. This is the only piece of the night in a foreign language, so if you want to pull those up, if you want to know some of what I'm saying, go ahead. Otherwise, feel free to just sit back and hear the complex music of Johann Sebastian Bach. Ach, ich bin ein Kind der Sünden, ach, ich irre weit und breit, der Sünden aussatz, so an mir zu finden, verlässt mich nicht in dieser Sterblichkeit. Mein Wille trachtet mir nach Bösem, der Geist verspricht, ach, wer wird mich erlösen? Aber vielleicht und Blut zu zwingen und das Gute zu vorbringen, ist immer alle meine Kraft. Will ich den Schaden nicht verhehlen, so kann ich nicht, wie oft ich will zählen. Drum nehm ich nun der Sünde, Schmerz und Pein und meine Sorgen wieder. So mir sonst unerträglich werde, und liefere sie dir, Jesus, seufzend ein. Rechne nicht die Missetat, die dich Meine Schuld durchstreicht. Dein Blut zu meiner Schuld durchstreicht, macht mir das Herz wieder leicht. Macht mir das Herz wieder leicht und spricht mich frei und spricht mich frei. Ruft mich der Höllen her zum Streiter, zum Streiter. Zum Streiter, zum Streiter, so steht Jesus mir zur Seite, dass ich beherzt, beherzt, beherzt und lieg auf beherzt und sieg auf sei. Mich der Höllen her, zum Streiter, zum Streiter, zum Streiter, zum Streiter, zum Streiter, so Dass ich beherz, beherz, dass ich beherz, ich beherz und sie hat sei. 
So that's Bach. Now we're going to fast forward. Um, let's see, from 1724 to 1971 uh, to look at the final piece of the evening, which is arguably one of the more controversial works throughout music history. Um, so the last piece we'll look at, the last work we'll look at, is Bernstein's Mass, which was first performed in 1971 and was greeted with hugely negative reviews. Looking from an academic standpoint, it's a really, really hard work to define. Um, it's been described as music theater. One could also make the argument that it's contemporary oratorio. It's just where oratorio was headed if oratorio had continued to be a big deal in the late 19th century. Um, or in the late 20th century, my bad. It also could just be a theatrical mass, given that it takes texts from the mass ordinary, which you would hear in a standard Catholic service. It's very rarely performed, as it requires about 200 people, and each individual score is super expensive. Um, before the premiere, as I mentioned, it's highly controversial. Before the initial premiere, the FBI actually warned President Nixon uh, against attending, as the Latin messages might have attended anti-war text. And that's not something that the government wanted to support at the time. Bernstein was actually already on FBI watch lists, as he had relatively leftist views at the time. And ultimately, Nixon elected not to attend so as not to support any potential anti-war messages. Um, so, if this is so controversial, why is it on the recital? Why did I choose to put this on here? I've actually elected to end the evening with Bernstein's A Simple Song from the Mass. A Simple Song is just that. It's a message of faith and celebration of salvation through God. It's a message of praise. It's a song that starts, Sing God a Simple Song, Lauda Laude. It begins in a recit style similar to what you've already heard many times this evening, leading into something more Arioso-esque, and then ends on a section that's typically very improvisatory. However, due to the fact that I'm working with a pre-recorded accompaniment, I actually didn't have the opportunity to improv at the end. So sit back and enjoy the last piece of the evening, Bernstein's A Simple Song. Sing God a simple song, loud a loud Make it up as you go along, loud a loud Sing like you like to sing, God loves all simple things. For God is the simplest of all. For God is the simplest of all. I will sing the Lord a new song to praise him, to bless him, to bless the Lord. I will sing his praises while I live all of my days. Blessed is the man who loves the Lord. Blessed is the man who praises him. Loud 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 and walks in his ways. I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence comes my help. I will lift up my voice to the Lord, singing loud, loud, loud. For the Lord is my shade. 
is the shade upon my right hand, and the sun shall not smite me by day, nor the moon by night. Blessed is the man who loves the Lord. Lord and walks in his ways. So thank you for tuning in. I hope you can recognize why I elected to end tonight's recital with that piece. I actually think it's the perfect piece to end just about any recital, but especially a recital of sacred music. <clears throat> so as I mentioned before, if anyone has any questions, feel free to reach out. I would love to talk about this music with you. Um, reach out, text, email, Facebook, whatever. I'm usually around. Um, but overall, thank you for tuning in and thank you for taking so much time out of your night to sit down and allow me to share this music with you. Um, that's all that I have to say. If anyone types a message in chat and it comes through after I end the live stream, I will respond in chat. <laughs> so Thank you so much and have a great night.